course. Okay, Reverend Williams, you're on, sir. Good evening, everyone. Glad you all could join us for this installment of Wednesday Night Bible Study. Let us look to the Lord. Father, we come before you to say thank you for another day. Thank you for another opportunity to gather together in community uh, to study your word. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be the teacher on the night, that you would empower Dr. Crating to speak what you would have her to speak. We pray that you would uh, work on our hearts and our minds, that we might receive those things which you would have us to receive on, the, on tonight through the teacher and by way of your spirit. Just have your way in the session that once we are through with the session that you would be glorified and your people would be edified. We love you and we bless you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and we say amen. 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 Thank you, Reverend Williams. I appreciate that. <clears throat> and good evening, everyone. It is so good, good to evening. see your face and names here. And so uh, we're excited about hearing more about Go the Locks of the Trojan Horse. More importantly, about how we can be originals in our service to the Lord. So this is an exciting uh, study that we have uh, coming up. And so before we get too much further, I want to share just a few uh, verses of scripture taken from Psalm 37. And this is what it says, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so, uh, as you know, last week we kind of left off with um, uh, Dr. Seuss. Um, Story, and we were talking about how minor differences actually become big differences when we're trying to form alliances. And so um, there is another Dr. Seuss story that's along the same lines, and it is called um, The Bat Butter Battle. And in this piece of the story has to do with an exchange between a grandson and a grandfather. And then it moves into the Zooks even having a word to say here. And so this is what that story says. On the last day of summer, 10 hours before fall, my grandfather took me out to the wall. For a while we stood silent. And finally he said with a very sad shake of his very old head, as you know, on this side of the wall, we are yooks. On the far other side of this wall live the zooks. And the things that you heard about the zooks are all true, that terribly horrible thing that they do. In every zook house and in every zook town, every zook eats his bread with the butter side down. And then the zooks say, butter, 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 bright every morning, noon and night. Spread your bread, spread it right. Pat, pat, smear, smear, pat, smear, smear, pat, pat, butter side down. And then the grandfather. But we yooks when we eat, when we breakfast or sup, we spread our bread right with the butter side up. To of course you remember our bread spreading rule that you learned as a lad back in bread spreading school. So here in this particular Dr. Seuss story, the big difference between the zooks and the yooks are the side of the bread that they butter, whether it's on the upside or the underside. And that's where they have built a wall in disagreement because of the side of the bread that they butter. A very small difference that makes a big difference in the lives of the Zooks and the Yooks. Does anybody remember that particular story? I remember it well for some reason. But I, I have a lot of Dr. Seuss books. 
All right. So what we're going to hear later on as we continue to discuss chapter five is how small differences really turn out to be major wedges in forming alliances and forming relationships. And we'll even talk about how that even occurred in, in the Bible in one of our biblical stories. And we will also hear surprisingly that um, people that we've heard about in history have very small differences in their beliefs, but it ended up um, making coalitions fall apart. So our objectives again for tonight are discover what the goals are for the body of Christ, conceptualize how to work with others towards our common goal, and reflect on how to deal with internal conflict and build unity within the body of Christ. So these again are objectives that we don't expect to accomplish all in one night, but we will touch on them in some way as we continue to discuss chapter five. So this particular chapter examines how originals form alliances to advance their goals and how to overcome the barriers that prevent coalitions from succeeding. And in this particular part of our discussion for tonight, we're gonna to hear about the very small differences that surprisingly make a big, big difference uh, to people like the Yooks and the Zooks. So um, in our discussion, um, and, and from your reading, we're going to talk about the narcissism of small differences or what's called in the book horizontal hostility. So uh, very recently, the word narcissistic, we've heard quite frequently in the news for some reason, something about someone's personality that's always about him, and I'll say him, pronoun for that particular person, and this person, every issue that came up in any part of the day, um, national, international, what have you, it always ended up back to this particular person's likes, dislikes, friends, or enemies. It always resulted back to this particular person's uh, desires. Very narcissistic, meaning that everything was centered on that particular person's personality. And as I'm saying that uh, outside of that one him that we're probably thinking about, there are other people in our lives who are very much like that, that um, almost like a two-year-old is all, all about me. You know, two-year-olds tend to think that the world revolves around them because they're just exploring the world. And so they're going, oh, I can control this and that. I can move this and that. And I can walk now too. But um, it's very difficult when we're dealing with someone who's very me-centered all the time. We're all needy at some point um, because of uh, vulnerabilities. That, that's a normal part of being a human, I think. But when it's to an extent that um, it's a burden on other people, then I think it, it has to be addressed in some way. Um, Perhaps in some um, one way to address it would be counseling or uh, therapeutic counseling and medication, or just someone just finally saying, listen, um, we're finding that in every discussion, everything is always about you. Can we kind of think about other people sometimes as we're making decisions on behalf of a group? We need to think about the concerns of other people. So, um, so we're talking about narcissism of small differences and the definition of narcissism is excessive interest in or admiration of oneself and one's physical appearance. Now, I, when I thought about someone who's always, you know, fixing their hair, makeup, and, you know, always, you know, trying to take care of their physical appearance all the time, um, narcissistic wasn't necessarily the word that came to mind. Um, uh, self-centered maybe, or vain, those kinds of words, but not narcissistic. I thought that that was an interesting part of the definition when I found that, but um, very, very interesting observation. And um, in our reading, we saw a statement by Sigmund Freud, and it says, it is minor differences in people 
who are otherwise a light that form the basis of strangeness and hostility between. So uh, I remember something that Renita Weem said. She, and by the way, if you don't know about Renita Weem, she is the first African-American woman in North America to get a PhD in uh, Hebrew Bible. They're just very down to earth, but down to earth and very interesting uh, black womanist theologian. Um, he said that people who are equally as oppressed should be natural allies and that she finds it interesting that often it's the opposite. People who are equally oppressed are not natural allies. They're not. And if you look in the, at the second bullet on our slide, you'll see uh, an, an example there was of a light-skinned Black woman was appointed a law professor at a university. And it was the Black Student Association that complained that she wasn't Black enough. And that would imply that they felt that her skin tone was not Black enough. Do we have any uh, kind of a similar situation in um, our, our, our offices or in other kinds of uh, maybe our church history that's very similar to that? Does anybody recall anything similar uh, in terms of our AME church history? If you're talking, you're on mute. Okay. All right, there seems to, there was, um, I think it was Daniel Payne was the first elected bishop of the AME church. And he declined it because he felt that it needed to be a different person to be the, the first bishop of the church. I see Sister Charlene Ive is going, yes. She's nodding her head, yes. That, that's uh, something that I read in our church history uh, long ago that he declined it because he was the uh, skin color that he was. And so he wanted someone else to represent the, the founding of this AME church. Also, I found very interesting that a deaf woman who had been crowned Miss America, uh, rather than being cheered because of this milestone that a, a deaf person had made, um, there were deaf activists who protested against her because she spoke orally rather than using sign language. So here we have a deaf person and a deaf person that you would think would be natural allies, but because this particular one spoke orally rather than using sign language, this one protested because they felt that if you're truly of the deaf culture, you would use sign language. Very interesting, isn't it? that people can be so very similar, but one slight thing drives a wedge between them. Now, I wonder sometimes, does that happen in our church? That we're there praising God together, praying together, uh, doing projects together. Maybe it's warm nights. Uh, maybe it's the food distribution. Um, maybe it was making care packages for our college students, whatever it was that we were doing together, uh, equally as committed, equally as called to, to the ministry of the Lord, yet there's one little something that's different that causes people to clash, and it breaks down alliances that otherwise would form to move the work forward. I do agree with you, Reverend Creighton. I think in, in, in the culture of the church, you, um, and you kind of touched on this last week when you deal with alliances and you have one alliance who believes it should be done a certain way and the other alliance who believes it's done another way. And they both have a common goal in mind, but because they have different methods about going about getting it, um, they seem to tear down or negate the other, the other party. It, I do think that that happens in our in our church culture. I think it happens in our race culture. Um, with us as as black people, we we tear down each other. We tear we tear each other down from the inside um, based on small differences when we should be united for the same cause. So I definitely do think that does happen. Um, I do I do think that happens 
in the church and, and sometimes you don't have you don't have the people who are um of the mindset of just hey it's not worth the fight it's not worth it's not worth the hassle we can just do it your way to get it done because it's all for the same goal sometimes you do have those tensions and those headbutting experiences that arise yes and and something you said made me think about go along to get along that we go along with it rather than saying, you know, there really is another way that this can be done. It doesn't always have to be this particular way. Um, and frequently, I know I do, I go along just to get along to get the task completed. I do it frequently, especially at church, especially at church. I know I do. I know I'm not, I'm not the only one. I have a girlfriend who's extremely smart. She can remember small passages of books she read like 15, 20 years ago. Uh, very smart. And she said, that says to me, you mean you can't do that? You don't remember that? You don't remember that? And I, I remind her, we're not all gifted in the same way. So, and that's okay. I don't have to be gifted the way you are. And you don't have to be gifted in the same way that I am. But we can certainly get a lot done together, can't we? because we're all gifted in some way. And just because mine is different doesn't mean it's a defect. It just means it's different, right? Same thing about our appearances. Just because we don't all look alike doesn't mean that one is defective and one isn't. It just means we're all different. And we thank God that we are diverse. Very thankful for that. We wouldn't need a whole world of, of Mary and Creighton for sure or in any one of us, that so we all have something to bring to the table. We're all gifted in some way. And the more that we affirm each other for the gifts that the Lord has blessed us with, I think the better off um, kingdom building can be. Amen. Any other thoughts about this? Well, Reverend Craven, this, this is Brother Ennis. I, I, I agree with Shandell. Uh... And scripturally, you know, the Bible says, I believe it's in Matthew, that, that we're violating, you know, the uh, scripture that talks about judgment, okay? Um, you know, when you look at it, basically that, that's what it is. We're, judge, we're judging each other. And, and the scripture says differently. So yeah. from, that, from that standpoint, that, that's where I'm coming from scripturally. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for and we do in, in the church. We do. I mean, we have a. I mean, and it's so obvious. You know, you know, you, you hear well. We used to do it that way. Then you hear, say, we're going to do it this way now, and you know, it's just a big clash. Okay, and, th and the common goal is not fully reached. I, like, you I, I, like you say, you end up giving into you know one party. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go along to get along, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I'll add something more to what you just said, Brother Ennis, if you don't mind, is um, I think so much has to do with the way something is said, that when you are expressing a different viewpoint in love, rather than being abrasive and abrupt and demanding, uh, just saying, can, can I offer a different viewpoint or a different opportunity uh, to approach this a different way. I think it has to do with the way things are said when we're talking to one another that makes a huge difference. Um, and, and for some people, you know, it, it doesn't matter the way you, a, a tone comes across, but- Exactly, exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. I think I think part of it is the tone. Um, I think part of it is the tone, but it's in certain situations. And since we're just talking about it here, it's in certain situations when you realize if there's certain people in the room, they're gonna have something um, contrary to say, regardless of the topic, regardless of the tone, regardless oh. of the intention. You oh. know, if they're in the room or if they're in the in the meeting, they're gonna have. The narcissistic attitude of small differences. <laughs> Let the church say amen. <laughs> amen. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> oh my goodness. Let me straighten up now. <laughs> but but here again, here again, you know, it's some you say it's the way it's said. That that's judging, that could be that person's. Uh, personality 
-hmm. Okay, so so I, I think you should look at it like, okay, that, that's just so-and-so speak. That's just the way they talk. It doesn't have to be taken personal. So like I, like I said, I, I think it's all a judgment thing, which, which violates the scripture there. <laughs> um, I, I think it says, judge not, least ye also be judged. It, it, exactly. I think it's Matthew 7 somewhere. I think that's where it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. But we're, we're getting at what I'm talking about here is this, the small differences between us. Um, back with the light-skinned Black woman and the Black Student Association, Black, per, black woman, Black Student Association equally as oppressed, right? <laughs> and yet still you're going to pr protest this particular one because of the color of her skin. Um, another way that I look at it is um, the move to bring children with disabilities in back well, I won't say back, into classrooms for the first time back in 1975, mirrored the civil rights movement. So we've got Black people who, you know, due to the civil rights laws, they were able to integrate schools and to be in classrooms. And then persons with, or children with disabilities, because of that civil rights um, legislation that went through, they started bringing children with disabilities into the regular classroom as well. And yet and still, it just baffles me, especially in an African American um, school or community for, for us to do things that imply that we will not make things accessible for people with disabilities. And for me, Black people have been so oppressed as have been people who are disabled or who have disabilities that you would think that we would naturally be inclusive, but we're not, we're not. We don't automatically think in terms of including marginalized people, although African-Americans have been marginalized since they've been in this country. So that, that always baffles me. <laughs> this is another point, just something that, you know, part of my history there. And, and that's kind of what we see even with, with our community and how they, how some of us treat those of the Latinx community, you know, knowing, knowing yeah. their oppression and knowing their struggles, we, we seem to put ourselves on the pedestal of we have arrived versus being empathetic and sympathetic to their plight, my opinion. As another person of color, I agree. We do. We, we, Somehow, somehow we, you're right, we, it's as though we think we've arrived when, as again, as Renita Ween said, we're just one paycheck away from the po house. <laughs> so, you know, just. What's, uh, what's, that, what's that phrase, our own worst enemy? Yes. Yes, we are. But we can do better. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do better. So it's time to reflect, time to think. In the education community, um, Sister Ivy, I think we would call this think, pair, share. So we think about a question, we pair up with a partner to discuss it, and then we share it with the larger group. And we don't have a way to kind of partner with a, a, a buddy and kind of you know discuss it a bit, but we can certainly reflect on it and share as, as you're comfortable. In your workplace or church, what are some small differences between you and someone else that have created barriers to getting things accomplished? It can be in your workplace. It, it could be at home if you, if you care to share that. But what have been some small differences that, that created barriers to um, getting things accomplished? Getting things accomplished. Do I have anyone who is willing to share now that you've reflected on it? Maybe you're texting your buddy and say, well, this is what I think happened. <laughs> think, pair, share. Well, I can share part of what happened in, in our office very recently 
there's a team of people that uh, are busily working on how we're going to now do our monitoring. Uh, there are lots of changes, as you, as you know, in the country, and they're thinking about how we're going to approach monitoring given all of the things that are going on now. And the responsibility of our office is to monitor states. And there's another group of people that are working on um, the correction of noncompliance. So they've got to think about uh, in those instances where findings have been made in the past, how are we going to um, support states in correcting that noncompliance? How are we going to do that? And so we've got two silo parts of our work going on at the same time, but there are times when they're beginning to bleed over into each other's areas now. And so they're trying to blend uh, the work to get the work done, but there were decisions that were long ago made in the correction of noncompliance group and decisions that are now being made in the monitoring group. And so we're busily working on supporting states, but because of the history of one group having done their work for much longer than this newly formed group, it's, it's not meshing well because you've got two different viewpoints that have, one has been long established and one they're just now brainstorming to figure it out, but they're not talking with each other as the new one is being developed. A very common goals in terms of supporting states, but because one was in existence longer than the other one, it's making it difficult to, to kind of mesh things together right now. And that made me think of sometimes in the life of the church, we have older persons who are more experienced with church activities and annual conferences and general conferences, and they know why we do the things that we do. And then you've got someone who's maybe new to African Methodism, or may simply just be a young person who hasn't had a chance to participate in all the committees and go to all the conferences and that sort of thing. And so you've got somebody with new ideas and wanting to try it without having all this history of tradition behind them to inform what they're thinking. And the person here is going, you know, we've, we've done this for a long time. We know how to do this. And this person is saying, well, you know, I, I think it can work this way. I think we can get it done this way. So that's, they're both loving the Lord. They're both at church trying to be involved in the church, but there is a small difference. And it's based on just history and experience versus being novel or new in this process. That's one thing that frequently kind of pops up as we're trying to get things done in the life of the church. Any other examples? All right, I guess we'll just go on, on that one example then, but I'm sure there are more out there. And it may be that it's, this isn't a good time to share it. So as I shared earlier that there are um, instances of splits in the Bible uh, and one very famous one has to do with the one between um, Saul and, and David. Um, and I'll read this portion of the scripture here. It says, when David returned from killing the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul, playing songs of joy on timbrels. And the women sang as they played and said, Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And then Saul became very angry. This saying did not please him. He said, they have given David honor for 10,000, but for me only thousands. Now, what more can he have but to be the king? And Saul was jealous and did not trust David from that day on. And then the next day, a bad spirit sent from God came upon Saul with power. He acted like a crazy man in his house while David was playing the harp. Saul had a spear in his hand and he threw the spear thinking, I'll nail David to the wall, but David jumped out of the way twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had left Saul. Small differences. They were both from small villages. They both loved the Lord and the spirit of the Lord was with both of them at some point. 
So they were very similar in ways. And yet, because of this small difference of praise going to David, Saul became jealous of him. And Saul was fearful that the Lord's spirit would be lifted from him. Jealousy. Jealousy of small differences. Who does he think he is getting a new sports car? Who does she think she is? Uh, who does she think she is going off on a vacation to Hawaii? You know, just small differences. Jealousy can tear down alliances. It can create all of a situation where we are so focused on each other for whatever reason and not focused on God that we can't accomplish the work of ministry. A lot of wasted time and energy. So there was an experiment that was described in our reading. And um, it was an experiment about groups. And in the groups, they were asked to sing with music. Uh, I believe it was O Canada, a national anthem. I see somebody read that part of the, the chapter. I found that so intriguing. And um, one group, and, and Sister Ivy, help me remember the pieces. There were three different groups. You remember what the three different groups did? You said, just a second, let me get my book. <laughs> Thank you for looking it up. One group was asked to listen to the music, I think. And one group all sang on, that members of the group sang on with a different tempo. As the music was playing, they sang with a different tempo. And then the third group, I guess you would call this one just right, like Goldilocks. It was a good fit. The third group all sang in unison. So you have three different experiment groups, right? So one just listened to the music. The other one, the members of the group sang on different tempos to the music. And then the third group all sang together in unison with the music. And then that they were told that that was the end of the experiment and that in, in the next part of what they were doing, they were given uh, a, a certain amount of money and they could either keep the money or they could give the money to other members of the group. So here was what I found very interesting. The group that, was, that gave the most money away to the other members of the group was a group that sang together in unison. How about that? The group that sang together in unison was the one that gave more of what they had, had been given to them to the other members of the group. So it, groups tend to find affinity or spontaneously come together when they use the same methods of engagement. So what do you think was the big aha moment for me? Because I'm thinking it's the same big aha moment for somebody else. If you look at this next picture, what do you think was the big aha moment for me? The big aha moment for me was that the people who sang together in unity were most likely to give what they had to others. Now, for the people that happen to be on this particular Bible study tonight, where are we most likely to sing together in unison? At church. At church. And when I saw that, I went, oh my God. So people who worship together, who praise the Lord together, who sing together, are more likely to be people who are the better givers. I see a thumbs up, thank you. Isn't that awesome? 
And there is an experiment that bears that out that when we come together and worship, and I know we're in a virtual worship situation now, but we're still coming together. We're reaching out into your homes and wherever you are, but we're still praising the Lord together. We still have our hands lifted up to the Lord. We're praying together, singing together. We're communing together. We're doing all these things together. And because of that, 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 to, that, that sharing of method coming together, a sharing of engagement coming together um, is making us give more to others. It give more of what we have to others, whether it's our time, our talent, or our treasure. I thought that that was a phenomenal moment in, in the reading of chapter five. So here, here's another moment for you to reflect, another moment to think, pair, share. How can we in our church and in our homes build better alliances and overcome the barrier of small differences? How can we use the same methods of engagement? How can we do that? I think Reverend Creighton, it goes back to kind of what we talked about earlier is being respectful of people's differences, hearing people out, um, allowing people a safe space, a clear space, an easy space to share. Um, and if and I go back to that, this one, um, I think it was a Fisher board we had where pastor had um, someone come speak about communication and things of that nature. And in, in that same space, um, where it's safe to share and things of that nature, kind of what you had touched on earlier is being um, intentional and in making sure what I'm sharing and how I'm sharing it, the tone in which I'm sharing it um, is conducive to the space we're in. So if you want to share something, making sure it doesn't have negative undertones, you're not with the attitude because that that pollutes the space we're in and it shifts the environment and shifts the attitude of the space so having the safe space to share and when you are presented with the opportunity to share to come with um <laughs> a positive <laughs> attitude of sharing and making sure how i'm conveying it is honestly um how i will want it conveyed to me how you know having that reciprocal attitude like I would want it to be shared to me that way and vice versa my opinion <laughs> thank you thank you for sharing that most of us uh want to be treated in a certain way and I think we should do unto others as we would have done unto us right that's, that's or, what I was going to say mm -hmm. yeah go ahead it goes to the golden rule the golden do unto others as you would have others do unto you mm -hmm. you know? treat others with the respect in which you like to be treated. So it just goes back to the old golden rule. Amen. And I know for me, and, I, and I'll and i admit this, and I've, I've probably admitted it more than I need to, I have a delivery method problem um, <laughs> in how sometimes I deliver stuff to people and it's not meant with the attitude that comes with it. And because I know that in safe spaces and sp I'm trying to be more conscious of how I say stuff because it can come across or someone can receive it, not how I intended for it to be said, but it's being aware of that and then being conscious of it when I'm speaking to people, especially in positions I hold and things of that nature, because that's not how you want people to view your leadership. So that's me. Thank you for sharing that. And, I, and, and you touched on leadership. Um, if nothing else, in, in my times and years being in churches and not just Turner, you know, I've been in a lot of other churches before that one, uh, leadership, especially in a, in a um, church, a religious setting is critical because there is a trickle down effect that is uh, for me, it can be so volatile if something is not in order in the leadership, especially in a church, because you're dealing with people's spiritual well-being. And if something is toxic along that chain of leadership, 
especially in a religious setting. It, it, it just saddens me, some of the things that I've seen, it just saddens me. So, um, and, and with that, I've said many times before in Bible study settings, especially, we should always pray for our leadership because that which opposes God knows that if they can get the church leadership out of sync or off kilter, then they scatter the sheep. So just keep leadership in, in prayer at all times, but leadership is supposed to be the example. They're supposed to be the example of how we should all conduct ourselves. And sometimes the examples we get are not the best ones. But again, we're all human too. So keep us in prayer, right? Keep us in prayer. So the way that we can use the same methods of engagement, say in a church, of course, would be singing together, doing ministry work together, um, and serving in community organizations together, such as um, the community coming together at, with the food distribution. That's just such a good example because you've got community volunteers coming. You've got volunteers coming from the, the synagogue to come over and help. I just think it's awesome what's going on there. It's, it's a diverse um, coming together in love. So originals must often become what's called tempered radicals. And we talked a little bit about that uh, last week when we were talking about uh, Jesus being a radical or was he a moderate radical or, um, and here uh, a tempered radical will uh, depart from traditions or go against the grain. Um, and they learn to tone down their radicalism um, to pre and present their ideas in less shocking kinds of ways. Um, they, they believe in values that depart from traditions and ideas that go against the grain, yet they learn to tone it down. And so uh, I want to share a little bit more about that. And this was covered again also in chapter five. Um, they, they lifted up an example of a temperate radical. Her name was Merida Perry. And Merida Perry was a, a college senior. And she asked, she started inquiring as to why it was that we were not thinking about ultrasound being used to generate air vibrations. She was seeing that they, you know, she had a wireless telephone and there were other wireless things that she had in her dorm room. And so she started asking around. She asked her physics professor about it and he doubted what she want, said could be done, could be done. Um, she went to ultrasonic uh, engineers who also doubted her theory of um, using ultrasound to generate air vibrations. And she even contacted the world's most respected scientists and they doubted what she said <clears throat> could be done. So she she's decided that she got tired of struggling. She, and, and her struggle, by the way, is the same as every original's challenge because she was challenging the status quo and trying to overcome the doubt of the key stakeholders. Have you ever had a new innovative idea and you were going, well, why can't it work? Why can't it work? And everybody said, just, just because I said it wasn't gonna work. It's not gonna work. And you, and you go and you ask, why not? And, and because I said it, it can't work. So guess what she did? Changed her approach. She changed her approach. She stopped telling the experts what she was, what her end goal was. Goal was. She just simply stopped telling them. And then she, she did something a little different. She only gave them the specifications <clears throat> for what it was she was trying to do. She didn't tell them what the end product was going to be. She only gave them what the specific pieces of it that pertain to them was that she needed from them. And so when she couldn't persuade the technical experts to take this leap of faith with her, she convinced them to take just a few steps by masking her purpose. Mm -hmm. How about that? Very interesting. Let's think about this. Time to reflect. As an original, have you ever had to mask your purpose 
in order to convince others to take a chance on an idea that you had? Think about it. And if you did, how did it turn out? This yes, Sister Louine. How did it turn out? Did you ever have to mask your purpose? Now I know some of us may not be able to talk about this. <laughs> Notice I've, I've chose a child for this image because we can talk about what we did in sixth grade, right? We're, that's comfortable. We can talk about that. We don't want to talk about what we did last week. <laughs> But have you ever had to mash your purpose in order to convince others to take that leap of faith with you? So nobody had to Louise do- muted. Louise's talking, but she's muted. <laughs> this thing, it, it's-, it's Everything is, I have a delayed reaction with everything on tonight. But anyway, I was just saying that until just now, something that I've been trying to get done at work for two years, I even did a, a paper. That's how I got my, um, <laughs> my, my senior paper was done on it. And just now it's like, oh, I have to change my approach. Cause um, I'm still struggling. <laughs> it's been two years and I'm like, okay, I get it now. I have to change my approach. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. So, so you're thinking you're going to have to change your approach in your paper about what it is you're trying to get to. Well, the, um, no, the, the, the pay, I mean, the, the paper was great. Um, so it's, it's not that it's the, it's, um, getting it done actually you know what i mean the the putting it into practice part mm, okay that's that's the part okay yeah practice mm -hmm. <laughs> interesting all right so let us know how how that goes once you use this new way of thinking about it yeah let us know how that goes so um a, a temperate ra radical is one who tones down the message um, in order for people to better hear it. Sometimes if we're so radical and so passionate about something that you are overbearing, it, people tend to back up. But if you make it uh, more temperate, more, more temperate, more uh, approachable, people are more likely to be drawn in and listen and truly hear what it is you have to say, as opposed to being uh, th threatened by or even intimidated by your degree of passion. So you, you miss the opportunity to win them over. Instead, you push people away. And often without realizing it, and you cloak it as not caring that you pushed them away. So I'm bringing us to a close for the this evening. And before we have our closing word of prayer, are there any other thoughts that anyone would like to share? Thoughts, questions? Next time, think about nothing. Okay, all right. So uh, we'll have the prayer to come in in just a moment and we'll read it together and you don't have to unmute yourself unless you just want to, to read it in unison. Uh, but I think it's beautiful doing it in unison, especially given the experiment that we heard about in our reading today. So let us read our prayer for this evening. God. We thank you for the Bible study opportunity. We thank you for the opportunity to see you engage with one another. We thank you for allowing us to understand that we lift up our voices in praise and worship to you. We are tearing down the barriers 
and small differences that separate us. Separate us, us and, and hinder, hinder us in reaching goals in ministry. So help us to always have a song in our hearts and on our lips for marvelous for your works. This we ask in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm excited that you all were there tonight and sharing. And next week, we will talk about the Trojan horse. Next week, we'll talk about the Trojan horse. God bless you. Virtual hugs. See you next yes. week. Yes. Yes. Great lesson. Great lesson. God bless you. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night.